use some technology from my colleague Enrique Gomes, who uh, also at Trinity College, so now at Oxford University. So uh, really the, the novelty of this talk is all due to Enrique, actually. I will be reviewing the history of Einstein's whole argument, which as a joke I turned into a five-act drama, but at the end there'll be a proposal. <clears throat> okay, so I think I need the arrow keys. Which I did. Okay, so first of all I'll tell you about Einstein. Then in Act 2, I'll talk about John Ehrman and John Norton, famous philosophers, Norton also a historian, who in 1987 used the argument uh, against a philosophical doctrine. Like all philosophical doctrines, it's an ism, so it's a bit vague, but the idea is space-time points are objects. In Act 3, we're going to uh, review replies in the 1990s, in Act 4, we're going to address a recent revival of interest in philosophy literature uh, in the whole argument, in which, led by Jim Wetherall at Irvine, uh, and with others, Fletcher Halverson and Manchak, there has been the uh, allegation that the whole argument never gets started. And I, d I don't believe that, but that's what Wetherall argues. Then, I should stress that in these Acts 3 and 4, uh, there's going to be a widespread view amongst philosophers which is nowadays called sophistication, which is the, for general relativity in particular, but even for any theory perhaps, any two isomorphic models or solutions of the theory, they are the same physical possibility, or if you prefer, they represent the same physical possibility. And in Act 5, I'm going to go back to my suggestion from, uh, shows my age, 20, 20 30 years ago, um, in which I'm going to say the great philosopher David Lewis invented something called counterpart theory, which he never used it to discuss the identity of space-time points, but it's very helpful to do so. And it has three merits. Two are about this philosophy debate, and one is about physics. So it's going to give us an answer to Ehrman and Norton. That was my suggestion 30 years ago. It's also going to help us answer Wetherall and his followers. And about the physics, it's going to suggest how to compare two points in models that are not isomorphic. Right? So the whole point of Act 5 is to go, if we're talking about Lorentzian manifolds, beyond comparing isometric manifolds and compare non-isometric manifolds and in particular think of one point in one corresponding to another point in the other. So the idea will be that points like that, they can be counterparts uh, thanks to their having similar attributes both in geometry and in as regards the matter fields but they're not actually identical as objects and we get neat connections between this philosophy framework called counterpart theory and ideas in gauge theory. And in particular, the, I want to stress that if you have a fixed space-time manifold, call it N, uh, then a model such as a Lorentzian manifold, just M, G, G, a Lorentz metric, a model based on the manifold M, given such a thing, then the model's isomorphic to it will be a fiber in a fiber bundle. So if you're just looking at Lorentzian manifolds, it would be the isometry class uh, of a given Lorentzian manifold will be a fiber in an infinite dimensional fiber bundle. And the diffeomorphism group on the fixed space-time manifold N would be the structure group of this bundle. So the fibers are themselves infinite dimensional. And a gauge fixing condition is a choice of, of a section of the bundle cutting across the fibers corresponds to a counterpart relation. So, uh, tell you outright at the very beginning, I mean, these gauge theory ideas are all from Gomes. It's just that recently we realized that his gauge theory ideas developed in collaboration with especially Aldo Riello and other people 
in the last five years neat, has a neat bridge with Lewis's counterpart theory. Okay, so that's the, the, that's the whole talk, really. Uh, and, and here's then the review. It's going to be Einstein, then it's going to be, oh, the philosophers revive the, the argument and uh, cause trouble for a philosophical doctrine of substantivalism. Then there were some replies by other philosophers, including me, saying substantivalism is not refuted. Then there's Weddell saying, oh, the argument dissolves, there's, not, there's nothing to it. And I'm going to reply to that with what goes and I call threading, like uh, when you do sewing, you, you, it's not identity, it's a relation of threading points together from one manifold to another. And finally, Act 5 is about fiber bundles and counterparts. So, um, here's Einstein then. General covariance, uh, it's a very non-historical Einstein, I should tell you. Uh, general covariance, considered in the active way that is often done now, uh, if a bold M1 is a solution, so it's a manifold, a Lorentzian metric, and a stress-energy tensor, and diffeomorphism little d is a diffeomorphism, then the drag along n tuple, well, d of m is in fact n, but the drag along of g and the drag along of t is also a solution. Um, you have redistributed across the various points of, of manifold n the qualitative profile of material and geometrical properties. Now, Einstein then, is, in effect, assumes distinct. If D is the identity map, except on a small patch, uh, H, then M2 is or represents a different possibility. So the, the shuffling around within H has produced a different possibility because you're taking seriously the, point, the nature of the points. Therefore, says Einstein in the summer of 1913, general covariance implies indeterminism, which is unacceptable. And it's especially unacceptable if H is small because then the indeterminism is more flagrant. Uh, so the, the history is, of course, fascinating because, uh, as many of you will know, he had just produced with Grossman the Edworth theory, which was his effort to implement the main ideas of general relativity and achieve general covariance. But for technical reasons, they could not obtain general covariance. This was due to uh, a, a, an error of thought by then about spatially flat manifolds had to be stationary. Or, or, sorry, stationary manifolds had to be spatially flat. And uh, this... Uh, led Einstein after that paper to say, well, if general covariance was not obtainable, we must think flexibly, and I will think of an argument why general covariance is something I should not have wanted for these last several years. And he thought of the whole argument. It's, it's the usual genius of Einstein, willing to change direction, change tack. Um, after 1915, he therefore, of course, had to reevaluate his whole argument against general covariance. And uh, in uh, correspondence, especially with, for example, Ehrenfest, he developed the, what's called the point coincidence argument. And in 1922, he, he had made a famous quote that space time is only a structural quality of the field, putting the fields first. Anyway, the, the idea of the argument is easily visualized. Uh, naively understood these two models represent two different distributions of uh, spatiotemporal relations encoded by the metric and different distributions of material properties encoded in matter fields over a common base space-time manifold. And inside the, 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 the dotted circle, which is my capital H, uh, there's a non-identity drag along. Okay. So in Act 2, in the 1980s, uh, Stachel and Norton rediscovered the detailed history using Einstein's notebook from his Zurich days. And in 1987, Urban and Norton adapted this argument to say that uh, substantivalism was wrong. Where substantivalism is the claim that space-time points are objects, which come kind of note to the philosophers, um, 
object in philosophy now comes with connotations essentially from Frege and Quine, uh, but we can just take it to mean object. And uh, Berman and Norton assume that substantivalism is committed to the assumption distinct, that it, it's a distinct possibility what, if, if uh, the qualitative profile has moved across the population of objects, and so substantivalism is false. So Act 3, well, there were various replies. Maudlin, Heffer, Butterfield. Substantivalism can and even should deny the assumption distinct. And nowadays, several adopt the view called sophistication, where you say any two isomorphic models are in fact representing the same physical possibility. Uh, now, I've just said that two such models in the GR case uh, differ about which space-time point has which qualitative profile of values of fields. So, as we say in boxing, it is going to take, not that I am a boxer, but it is a standard English metaphor, catchphrase, it is going to need fancy footwork by sophistication if it is to count as substantivalist, because you've got, you've got objects, but you're, you're denying that the witch's witchness is... Uh, is uh, factual, in effect. So there are four developments worth taking a glance at. Uh, one is uh, saying that the second model produced by the Dragon represents the same possibility as the first. So you're really saying that for each space-time point, its geometrical properties and relations are, in philosophy jargon, essential to it. In philosophy jargon, we talk about possible worlds, for possibilities. In any possible world containing this point, it has those attributes. And uh, Maudlin advocated this. It's come to be called metrical essentialism. The trouble is it's a severely limited doctrine. And at least in Maudlin's hands, he only says it about the actual space-time points. The result is that his, his reply to the whole argument says literally nothing about models that are not isometric with the actual cosmos assumed to be uh, given by a solution of general relativity. There's a generalization of that uh, metrical essentialism, which will figure in upcoming slides. Uh, Gomes and I call it the drag along response. It's going to generalize the previous idea of essentialism. It says in italics, the diffeomorphism drags along the identity of each point from one model to another. So the idea is, if the, if the diffeomorphism little d sends a point little p to little q in the, M, in the bold m sub 2, the dragged along model, you must say, oh sorry, I said little q, but officially little q really is p, because actually I've dragged along all the geometric and material properties and relations, and so little q over here, enjoying the dragged along metric and the dragged along stress energy tensor, is officially the little p, which was the argument. Okay? That's the spirit of the drag along response. And uh, it certainly does implement sophistication in the sense that two isometric, or for the Lorentzian manifold, t equals zero case, or isomorphic models in general, do represent the same physical possibility. Of course, the trouble with this is that it does make contradictory assertions about points in a model that has an automorphism. Because if the model you begin with, bold m sub 1, has some automorphism that sends little p to little q, and you then say that q is officially p, then yikes, you've got two, two models identified in one of the same manifold. And of course, if the model is homogeneous, that in the sense that for all P and Q in the, in the manifold, there's an automorphism that sends P to Q, then the drag along response faces the abysmal embarrassment that there is just one space-time point. Okay, so you've got to allow objects, in particular space-time points, to be distinct in what in Latin, and therefore Italy, we would call solo numero, right? uh, a, 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 adopted by philosophers. And that, that is standard practice in logic and, and philosophy, something about which uh, Simon Saunders, who's here this week, has written a great deal. Um, not that I want to put Simon on the spot, but if you want to talk about logic and identity, talk to Simon this week. 
Okay, so given, given these troubles, uh, one naturally asks, should sophistication claim that its version of substantialism denies that there are facts about which space-time one has which qualitative profile of field values? Would, would such a silence about which is which still deserve the name its belief in points as objects? And there's some discussion of that. Okay. The, the fourth development is this thing I want to concentrate on, which is the counterpart theory advocated by Lewis in, in a paper in 68 and two books in 73 and 86. It says, and he's not talking about space time points, only talking about objects in general, and he's very involved in uh, thinking about philosophy and its problems in terms of a set of possible worlds, for which he's a great advocate of this framework. Objects in two different possible worlds are never identical. They're counterparts of each other, better or worse counterparts, according to how similar they are. Now, at first, this seems wrong. As the other famous philosopher Kripke objected with a, a very mid-1970s style example, Hubert Humphrey might have won the 1968 US election against Richard Nixon, says Kripke. And we all agree he might have, if only he had. And says Kripke, this is about what you might call the actual Humphrey, our Humphrey, the Humphrey who is in this same actual cosmos with us, not some distinct person who is in some way qualitatively very similar but slightly more fortunate politically than our actual poor miserable Humphrey. It's about our Humphrey, says Kripke, thumping the table. Now, the joy of, of this debate is that the Kripke is convincing when you first read him. If you think hard enough and you read Lewis's reply, you realize that his, his replies are completely convincing. And there's really some, it, it's going to be tough to maintain that objects are actually the very same things in different possible worlds. Lewis argues well against the, the strong identity view. It's also clear that counterpart theory is going to treat these sorts of propositions about how things could be more flexibly than doctrines of transworld identity, so called. Because similarity is vague and it comes in degrees, and in particular, you can have two objects in one possibility equally similar to a given one. And as I recall, Lewis even has a, a, an everyday example of this. You say, I could have been twins. Now, one can hear that sentence as being true, right? And it means there's another possible world in which my parents, at about the same time, uh, had, had twins rather than a single person me. Okay, so I urge the merits of counterpart theory, and uh, it answered the whole argument, and as I say, it, it leads into uh, considering non-isometric space-times. Well, Weatherall, Act 4, uh, and his kindred spirits, Fletcher, Hobbes, and Manchak, said our uh, whole argument never gets started. This was after a 20-year uh, quiet period for the whole argument. Mathematical modern, pra modern mathematical practice di dictates the drag along response. Now, I think this is wrong. And uh, there are three replies, and uh, the first is perhaps the crucial one. Don't read philosophy straight off the practice of mathematics. Uh, I fully agree, Gomes fully agrees, mathematics is indifferent to the identity of objects. You see that in category theory and in so-called structuralism in the philosophy of mathematics. But indifference makes for being flexible and opportunistic in making stipulations about what counts as the same as what. It does not make for some uniform diktat from the uh, head office, which is what the drag along response is suggesting. Okay, uh, there's, there's been criticism of Weatherall and his followers, in particular by Pooley and Reed, and by Menon and Reed, and uh, let me just read the first four lines. Everybody agrees that GR doesn't care about which points instantiate which properties, about the differences in the so-called transworld identities between points in models and manifolds, but that doesn't settle interpretative or philosophical issues, so you can still raise the philosophical issue. Never mind the long quote, but uh, Oliver Pooley writes, you shouldn't just dismiss the whole argument saying 
I, that you can remain loftily above the metaphysical fr fray. You've got to get down and do the philosophical uh, dialectic. Third comment, mathematical practice is much more flexible than whether or the last points do get identified across models, threaded as we call it, one to another in various ways, and it need not be by isometries. But I do agree, we do agree, that for a wrinkly space-time, one with no automorphisms except the trivial identity, and it's dragged along by some diffeomorphism D, it is, of course, overwhelmingly natural to thread the points according to the right? I'm not denying that. But you see all sorts of contexts in which you don't thread by identity. I won't go into this because of the lack of time, but even to define the E derivative, you need to hold the points fixed and slide the fields along the interval curves of the vector field with respect to which you're taking the Lie derivative. And there's a lovely quote from the great Arnold where he calls the Lie derivative the fisherman's derivative. The flow carries all possible differential geometric objects past the fisherman and he just sits there and differentiates them. Well, the fixed riverbed of the great Arnold is what Gomes and I are uh, pointing your attention to, uh, that you need the fixed riverbed to make sense of the derivatives not being vanishing, the identically vanishing. Okay, so such a correspondence we call a threading scheme. We say that two points are threaded together, and we say a threading scheme to signal that there's no single canonical scheme. But you'll need non-zero lead derivatives in order to talk about uh, the motion of a non-rigid continuous body, for example, and in Nota Second Theorem and General Relativity. And you need threading also in this uh, wonderful Garrosh paper of 1969, where he constructs limits of space-times in communications mathematical physics. He threads points between non-isometric space-times. Uh, he assumes that you're given a one-parameter family of space-times, four-dimensional, m sub lambda, one-parameter family with lambda greater than naught. He assumes that you can put them together into a five-dimensional manifold curly m, and the limit of the family is going to be a suitable boundary of this curly m corresponding to lambda equals naught. And he, he makes a certain construction, but what's important is that there is going to be a congruence of curves, not a canonical one, there are different curves you could adopt, but there's a congruence of curves uh, threading uh, points between one four-dimensional manifold and a non-isometric other four-dimensional manifold. So this congruence of curves cuts the four-dimensional leaves of the five-dimensional manifold just once. And so the, the, the curve, call it gamma, or rather the image of the curve lying in the four-dimensional, uh, lying in the five-dimensional manifold, is a set of points that are threaded together. Okay, so I won't, won't go into detail, we can talk about it. But, final act, arising from the ashes of these philosophical controversies, there is, say I, say Gomes and I, like feelings. Uh, a beloved fiber bubble. So the idea is this. It's an infinite dimensional fiber bubble. Given a space time, n, comma, g, comma, t, you can more or less forget everything I've said about the whole argument now, because that was just a springboard to give you this fiber bubble. Nothing I'm about to say in this slide will really depend on all the junk I've told you about. Right? So given a space time, n, g, t, the set of all models that are built by all the diffeomorphisms, little d on n, and meaning, and with the drag along of the metric and, and the capital T, the set of all models is going to be the fibre of a, of a principal fibre bundle. The structure group that slides you up and down the fibres is the diffeomorphism group of the, the background fixed once and for all space time and fold m. So let's set aside T and work in vacuo. So we just talk about Lorentzian manifolds. If you fix the manifold M, the class of all the Lorentzian manifolds is fibered into isometry classes by diff M. And the base manifold, which is the set of orbits under diff M, is 
we could call it Lorentzian superspace, or for short, superspace. But as many of you will know, superspace is normally used for, for Riemannian geometries. Sadly, famously, notoriously, we don't have a real slice theorem for Lorentzian superspace. Uh, the only paper I know on this is Eisenberg and Marsden, 1982, where a certain restricted slice theorem uh, is given. We won't get into that, but uh, the framework that I'm about to describe, the last two slides, is uh, vivid and helpful even without the full uh, rigor of a slice theorem. Um, so here's the analogy with gauge theory. In gauge theory, the main idea relating um, nearby fibers is the connection. And the tangent space at the point is split into a vertical subspace and a horizontal subspace. Uh, the horizontal subspace is sort of an infinitesimal bridge to points in a nearby fiber, uh, or vectors within it are. Similarly here in field space in this infinite dimensional space where the points are entire solutions, entire configurations of the metric uh, on a fixed manifold big M. So really what we're saying is that there's a, a literature, physical and philosophical, that is going to give you frameworks for relating fibers which are non isometric and points on fibers that are not isometric. So we're going to have a framework for comparing different possibilities which will involve threading space-time points across the copies of the manifold M in, in, the, in the two elements of the fiber. Now, in a three-dimensional context for spatial geometries and Riemannian metrics, as many of you will know, Barbara and Bertotti in 1982 gave a definition which they called best matchings, later dubbed also equilocality, which goes uh, 10, 12 years ago, realized, represents a connection on Riemannian superspace. So there is a uh, straightforward uh, implementation of the connection idea in the Riemannian superspace case. But in GR and Yang Mills, thus on Lorentzian manifolds, Gomes and Riello, and also Gomes and Riello and Hopfmuller, have a set of papers in which they have a connection on uh, the relevant field space. In particular, they focus on what they call the Singer-DeWitt connection. And in GR, it's uh, been studied in detail. In Abelian and Yang Mills, it's integrable and actually leads to the Coulomb gauge, so it's, in it's an integrable connection. It it's therefore specifies sections, and it leads to gauge fixing with the Coulomb gauge. And Final slide, Lewisian counterpart theory. Well, the idea would be that a choice of a section in this Lorentzian superspace can be given point by point. Uh, that is, point by point as regards the space-time manifold big N that you chose at the very beginning. So there's this infinite specification of the threading of space-time points across the copies of the manifold N in the different fibers of so, in particular, a curve in such a section is a one-parameter family of diffeomorphisms of N, but these diffeomorphisms are not isometries, but we use this diffeomorphism to thread the space-time points from one copy to another, but of course we're not, we're not threading by drag along, there's no, there's no isometry here. Right? So a curve that lies in such a section is precisely like a curve in... Garrosh's five-dimensional manifold that cut each of his four-dimensional leaves just once. So, this is, in philosophy jargon, a matter of a counterpart relation which specifies a threading. And actually, we can define a, a natural measure of the similarity of two field states using the structure group. And this uh, measure has uh, nice covariance properties. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions, maybe.
Thank you. I'd like to know your views on the following claim that the Einstein whole argument has important implications for quantum theory. Uh, if we say that the operational distinguishability of space-time points requires that we overlay them with a metric, then in a universe, even a low energy universe, which has only quantum systems, because of the uncertainty principle, you cannot produce a unique classical metric. And then the whole argument implies that the distinguishability of space-time points is lost. So in the absence of classical systems, if you have only purely low energy quantum systems, you have to describe them without making reference to space-time points. And in that sense, quantum gravity is also a low energy phenomenon, not just a blank scale phenomenon, because you lose space-time points. Uh, well, let me know what you would think about it. Um, well, thank you. It, it, it's it's uh, the topics of your question are really outside the talk, but if you want to know briefly, I would say, I would emphasize that uncertainty principle as such in the familiar forms doesn't kill off belief in space-time points or spatial points. I, uh, but I do agree that uh, the whole argument is uh, germane to discussions of quantum gravity or how to more generally put quantum and space-time together because although I didn't stress it, of course, in GR there is a whole tradition of thinking about uh, what are the observables that in ways that respect the diffeomorphism invariance, which is like the active general covariance of my slides. And that led Komar 50 years ago to think in terms of uh, parameterizing the space-time points in terms of uh, things like uh, scalar curvature, which are, as the name suggests, diffeomorphism invariant. So there is the, the, the idea of specifying counterpart relations in R jargon by the values of Komar observables, that's very close to, to this talk. I hope that helps a bit. Yeah. <clears throat> um, th thanks, Jeremy. That's, um, revisiting many questions that we've been going on over for 30 years, one way or another. But, um, and I just want to come back to the objection towards the Dragon point of view, which I take it to be the, the dominant view among physicists. I, I, I think that probably would agree with that. So, um, if the idea is that uh, when you've got isometries with the metric, um, that the dragon on view somehow implies a collapsing of everything into a single point and so forth. But one, of course, still has diffeomorphic invariant relations between points, even when they're related by isometries. So it doesn't seem that this implication follows automatically. I think you need something else in order to get to the view that it collapses everything to a single point. Do you have a quick comment on that? Uh, 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 thank you. Yes, I, I, I do agree. I mean, completely. And it was your work about the uh, topic in general that stressed the uh, way you could appeal to things like symmetric but non-reflexive relations between objects to uh, justify their being genuinely distinct, despite their having uh, exactly matching uh, arrays of intrinsic properties. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. The abysmal embarrassment allegation uh, in order to uh, stick, that accusation to stick needs a bit more than I said out loud or indeed than the uh, Woodrick Muller literature uh, picks out. There's, there's a two philosophers of physics, Woodrick and Muller, who ten years ago uh, had a, an exchange in which the, the wonderful phrase abysmal embarrassment occurred in the title of uh, one of the papers, hence the occurrence on the slide. Yeah. In uh, your last uh, uh, statement, you claimed that uh, threading makes it possible to define a similar measure between, say, two different space times. Uh, is that a vision, or one can just construct this uh, uh, measure of similarity? or closeness between two space types? 
Uh, yes, it, well, thank you. The, the, the proposal is, uh, for you as a physicist, I'm afraid, regrettable. <laughs> because it, uh, it's flexible. Uh, it's, it's not closely connected to, uh, it's not fully specified by the, the, the physics. It, relative to a choice of section in this fiber bundle, there is a, a uniquely natural way to talk about counterparts. And sensible choices of section would encode things like peels to matter fields or Comar, the values of Comar observables in order to uh, uh, make judgments about what's most similar to what from one model to another non-isometric one. But it's, it is not a, a, a full canonical choice here. 